My name is Furman Fordham. I am the senior pastor of Riverside here in Nashville. And we want to welcome you to our Riverside family and to our ministry. We are so happy that you have tuned in. Our prayer is that you will come to know God, grow in God, and sow God's love. We are praying that this presentation will be a blessing to you. And if you are ever in Nashville, we invite you to come worship with us. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you soon. You are aware that the Lamb is worthy. Let me hear you say amen. You've experienced the power of the blood in your life. You ought to feel all right right now. God has done nothing else. He has redeemed me by his blood. Death was my destiny but the blood. And so God gets everything. He gets it all. He gets all praise, honor, and glory. And so I magnify the name of our Christ this day because he's been good. He has been good. It is uh, good to stand in pulpit as nerve-wracking as it is turn to your neighbor and say the preacher is still nervous this is this is second time in his pulpit but he's still he's still he's still nervous lessons learned from round one bring something to wipe the sweat I was encouraged by Sister Melville, after the last time, yes, you're laughing because you know Sister Melville can encourage you, can't she? She, she? she came up to me and said, Pastor, that was an excellent message. Now, I want you to know that it wasn't you, it was the Holy Spirit, so don't get the big head. Lessons learned from the first time. I praise God for Sister Melville's words of wisdom. I praise God for um, just seeing fit to use one like me. I want to uh, turn your attention to our text for the morning. It is from the book of Acts. We are going to visit Luke's second gospel. He is the author of the synoptic gospel that bears his name, but he is also the author of part two, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look in Acts chapter one see if God can encourage our souls today. I'm going to be reading in your hearing verses 1 through 11. The first five verses I am offering to you by way of introduction we will spend our focused attention on verses 6 through 11. If you are glad that God loved you enough to communicate and to talk to you through his word, won't you stand with me as we read from it? You will find it on the screen from the New International Version of the Bible. And Luke writes these words in my former book, Theophilus. 
I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. He's speaking of his former book, the gospel. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Just pause for a moment and say, talk to me about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, he was eating with them. He gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Beginning at verse 6, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. <clears throat> men of Galilee they said why do you stand here looking into the sky this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven I want to speak with you the next few moments under the topic the paradigm is shifting the paradigm is shifting will you please pray with me and for me father every now and again The word of God grabs a hold of a man and transforms him into the man of God. God, send your word forth to these people and let it transform them into men of God women of God. May it touch some boy and turn him into a son of God. May it grab a hold of some little girl and transform her into your daughter. Do not disappoint yourself this morning. Let the words of my mouth bring you praise the words that I speak be seasoned with your love and grace. May the things, O oh Lord, that I choose to say bring glory and not shame to your name this day. Let the words of my mouth bring you praise. You've been bought by the blood. Won't you say amen? You may be seated in the presence of our God and of his Christ. The paradigm is shifting. The paradigm is shifting. It was just three weeks ago 
that the SCOTUS visited us, the Supreme Court of the United States determined that it was inconsistent with the Constitution of the Kingdom of the United States to prevent those who have identified themselves as homosexual to receive the rights and privileges of all of the rest of the other married citizens in its kingdom. The Supreme Court determined that it was constitutionally correct that homosexuals be allowed to be married in its kingdom. I've heard, I've seen, I've looked, I've watched the conversations, Facebook, Twitter, news, and oftentimes the gay rights movement, as it has so been called, has been compared to the civil rights movement that dominated the middle of the last century. There has been this comparison to the quest, the need, the urgency, the want, the rightness of the gay rights movement with that of the civil rights movement. Yes, it's a touchy subject, huh? And in large degree, I agree. Very, very similar. However, there is a more fundamental manner in which there's a problem with this comparison. Allow me to take a few moments to highlight it for you. If we are strictly looking at the Constitution of the Kingdom of the United States, then we must agree that it is right that all of its citizens should be afforded the rights and privileges of every one of its other citizens. Whether you agree with homosexuality or not, you are challenged to disagree that the Constitution of the Kingdom of the United States guarantees the rights of all of its citizens. You are challenged. In this sense, very much so, the gay rights movement is, is very similar to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. There was an alignment then with the constitution of the kingdom of the United States that Dr. King and those he was leading had. There was an alignment, they argued that the Constitution guarantees us these rights and these privileges. Similarly, the gay rights leaders argue the same thing, that the Constitution of the Kingdom of the United States guarantees us, or at least it should guarantee us, these same rights and privileges. What made the civil rights movement strong was that it also aligned 
with the constitution of the kingdom of heaven. The principles that lay underneath the civil rights movement not only were in alignment with the constitution of the kingdom of the United States, they were also in alignment with the constitution of the kingdom of heaven. It is in the sense that I agree with the gay rights movement that when we, when we measure it against the constitution of the kingdom of the United States, there is an alignment. Where, where, where we begin to depart and differ from the civil rights movement is, is that when we attempt to align the fundamental premise and principles of the gay rights movement, there is not only no alignment with the constitution of the kingdom of heaven, it actually is diametrically opposed to the constitution of the kingdom of heaven. Fundamentally, this is the difference. As I thought about this, it, 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 it struck me, as I thought about what the Supreme Court had done, I, I came to, to a moment of utter shock not at the fact that they had legalized gay marriage. That's pretty consistent with the Constitution of the Kingdom of the United States. What shocked me was that for the first time that I could think about, and maybe, maybe you can think of some other time, I would like to know, but for the first time, The kingdom of the United States has determined by law something that is diametrically opposed to the constitution of the kingdom of heaven for the first time. This, this startled me. I don't know if it rings in your mind as loudly as it does in my mind, but, but the paradigm is shifting. This is a major paradigm shift. For the first time, our government has aligned itself in a diametrically opposing orientation to the kingdom of heaven. This is major. In the arguments before the Supreme Court regarding this question, Judge Alito asked the question, what shall we do about a brother and another brother who have determined that they want to be married and spend the rest of their lives together because they love one another. They share life together. This was the question Judge Alito Asked, if we allow this, what stops us from allowing that? The paradigm is shifting. We're not talking about a lower court. We're talking about the law of the land in diametric opposition to the constitution of the kingdom of heaven. Are you following me? Maybe, maybe a lot to swallow in a moment. But think about this. This is major. The paradigm is shifting. And I just wonder if God is
is intending to alarm his people to a fundamental truth. That as much as you want to believe it, the kingdoms of this world are not the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. I wonder if he is sounding the alarm that you must begin to choose between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. I wonder if the recent events are really God signaling the paradigm shift. People, especially you black Christians, think long before you place your hope in the kingdoms of this world just because you have a president that looks like you. Dot, dot, dot. The paradigm is shifting. For the disciples, I've chosen this text because it chronicles a major paradigm shift in the life of these apostles. And it was all about kingdom paradigm shifting. And I think this text gives us some very good nuggets as to how we ought to respond as we are observing such major tectonic paradigm shifts going on around us. So can we look to the text? Let's, let's, let's look to the text and see how we ought to respond. What should the people of God do? What would God have us to do as we observe such major paradigm shifts? How does God expect us to respond? What should we be thinking? And I believe that there are three things that God wants to show us that Jesus left with his disciples. First, let's, let's, let's understand how major this paradigm shift was for the disciples. Now, you got to, listen, their attitude, their mindset, look at the question that they ask in verse 6. Are you at this time, Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, they had a paradigm. They had a paradigm, and Jesus was on the verge, even though they didn't know it, Jesus was on the verge of rocking, shifting their paradigm, because in the next few minutes, he goes from possibly, in their minds, restoring the kingdom to Israel, something that their people had waited for for over 600 years, to disappearing into the sky. This was a major paradigm shift. They had come to believe that he was the Messiah. They saw him die on the cross. They knew that he was placed in the tomb. They come back, gone from the tomb. Oh my goodness, he rose from the dead. And Luke is intentional to describe and to define and to clarify that over the 40 days from his crucifixion to this very moment, he had given them many convincing proofs that he was alive. They were sure he was the Messiah, but their paradigm of the Messiah was restore our kingdom to us. They were in for a major paradigm shift. And the first thing that Jesus invites them to do in order to manage this major paradigm shift he invited them to shift their attention from self-control to God-control. He invited them to shift their attention from self-control to God-control. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus says in verse 7, he said to them, hey, hey, it is not for you 
to know the dates or the times. The, I believe the King James says the times or the seasons, the periods of time, the, 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 the circumstances around which the Father has set by his own authority. The temptation for us in times of major tectonic paradigm shifting is to want to, 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 to saddle up and to try to control and dictate the paradigm shift that we think needs to take place. We, we, we need to stand up and we, we need to take on this and but Jesus very gently reminds us that regardless of how uncertain and unsettling the changes will be, God is still in control. Put your faith and your confidence that God has a shift that he's making. It's his paradigm shift that needs to happen, not yours. You know, I, I have a family of uh, four children. That's a small city. And, um, and, and the dynamics of my family are, 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 are very interesting. We have full-blooded, half-blooded, and step-siblings all in the same house. So as you can imagine, now, 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 now this, this, this makes for an amazing level of love that gets created in this kind of dynamic. You, 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 you would be surprised at, at how much of an interesting, fun, loving community it can become with such strangers. But every now and then, the citizens can get restless too. And the full and the half and the step starts to come out. And we'll have, Gabrielle and I'll have one of the citizens bring to us a complaint against the other. And as we are attempting to address the offense with the one, here comes the offended one over the left shoulder with advice on how we ought to be dealing with this. They have a paradigm, they have an idea of how this thing ought to turn out. I mean, I'm not liking the way this conversation is going. It looks like y'all going to have some grace and mercy here. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. I'm offended. I got, I got a paradigm. I need to a push here. And, and so Gabrielle and I will, will generally simply turn our head and look at the intruder as if to say, can I handle this? Can I take care of this? I mean, this, you brought it to me. I, I, I have authority here, and trust me, I, we're going to deal with it quite well. Sometimes when we look into our world and we see offense and bad things happening, we want to, we want to insert our agenda. We want to look over God's shoulder and, and, say, and say, are you at this time going to make some stuff right? When are you going to bring our kingdom here? We're tired of the kingdoms of this world. When are you going to bring our kingdom here? And God simply turns to us and he's looking and he's saying, I got this. I got this. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons or the manner or the way that I'm going to fix this. Just trust me. Incidentally, you can apply this to your own personal life. Some of you have some paradigms about your own life that are a little bit different from God's paradigm for your life. And you're looking at God and you're saying, um, here's how things really need to go. Okay, God, let me tell you about this. And God is looking at you, and you're feeling it in your life. He's looking at you, and he's saying, um, will you let me handle this? 
will, 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 you, will you stand down just a little bit? You know, some of y'all are looking at your kids and you want God to do something. You're going to sit God on them. God, God's looking and saying, I, I, will you let me handle this? I'm in control. This is the first way God is inviting us to respond to the major tectonic paradigm shifts that are happening in our world and in your life. Recognize that God wants to shift your attention from you to him. From you controlling the outcome to him controlling the outcome. Can you do that? Second thing, second thing God wants to invite us to do is he wants to shift our assignment. He wants to shift our assignment. Look at, look, look, look at, look at what Luke says to us in verse 8. However, or but, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in, Jer in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This was a major, major, major. <sighs> what was this? Declaration by Jesus. This was the meat in, in the ve veggie burger sandwich. Th this, was, this was the heart and soul of his paradigm shift. Did you know that as God is shifting his paradigm from, or shifting the paradigm from the kingdom of Israel to the kingdom of Jesus, he was inviting the disciples to be the primary shifting agent. This is what this declaration is. He's inviting them to be the primary partner with him in shifting the paradigm. He's declaring to them, you see, you see, the disciples had an idea of what the kingdom of Israel was supposed to look like. It was to be, supposed to be us Jews ruling the world. It was supposed to be us Jews throwing down the Romans. Those nasty, sorry Samaritans, just get rid of them. And we are going to be ruling the throne of our father, David, Messiah, Jesus. Are you at this time going to make us front and center? But Jesus has quite a different paradigm. Jesus is declaring to them, no, wait a minute. I, I want you. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. I want you. And even in Judea, I want your cousins. But you will also be my witnesses in Samaria. I want the people that you don't like, too, in my kingdom. See, my, the paradigm of my kingdom is a little different from the paradigm of your kingdom. In fact, not only do I want the Samaritans, but I also want those who are in the uttermost parts of the earth the disenfranchised, the felons, the, the, the illegals, the nasty, smelly, homeless, the, the, the mentally ill, and yes, the homosexuals too. I want them in my kingdom. See, that's why my kingdom is different 
from your kingdom. This is why my paradigm is different from your paradigm. Your paradigm is all about you and your kingdom. But my paradigm is about all men. I want everybody in my kingdom. And I'm asking you, disciples, to be my witnesses in shifting the paradigm. You see, the new paradigm is my kingdom. I'm shifting the paradigm. I, my dad used to drive a Vega. Now, if you know anything about Chevy Vegas, they symbolize why General Motors is nothing today. These were horrible cars. But my dad had a Vega. Now, this was his pre-Cadillac days. See, this is back when he, he still had some loans he was trying to pay off. He couldn't afford no Cadillacs yet. But he had a Vega, and he had a four-speed manual Vega, and, and I love to ride in the Vega with him because from the passenger seat, as a little boy, he would let me shift the gear. So he's driving along, clutches in, and I knew when the clutch went in and the gas came off, time to go down to second. Gas would go out and the clutch would go in and it was time to go up to third. Sometimes I would miss it and get it back in first and he'd help me to get it in third. Going along, clutch in, gas out, and it was time to go down to fourth and you'd hear a grind. I, I'd, I'd accidentally hit that reverse and he'd, he'd help me get it, get it into, into fourth gear. But, 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 but daddy would allow me to shift. He, he would allow me to participate in driving the car. Riverside, God is calling you to shift from an inward-focused worship to an others-focused worship. This is the primary move agent in his paradigm shift. Let me say it another way. Jesus ain't coming till you get up and do something. This is the paradigm shift, y'all. God has invited us to be the shift agent. He has invited us to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how we navigate his paradigm shift. To move us from a self-centered worship to an other-centered worship. God is calling us. This is an integral part of his paradigm shift. His paradigm will not fully be brought into reality unless we shift. We've got to move. He's asking us to move, to shift. It is easy for us to gaze out onto the homosexual community or any other community for that matter that might be diametrically opposed to the constitution of the kingdom of heaven and simply say, God, will you just bring our kingdom and get rid of them? It's easy to say that. But what God is declaring, no, 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 no. I want them to. I can change them. I just need for you to be my witness. Because at one time, you were the same level of trash that they are. And I changed you. I need for you to be my witness. 
There's some homosexual out there that's looking for liberty, looking for freedom, and just don't believe it can happen. Why don't you take what used to be your sorry self and go be a witness of what God can and will do? This is what God is inviting us to do. He is inviting us to be a part of this. We are his example of his power, his transforming power. And so I believe that the Supreme Court ruling is a blessing from God. Because now every homosexual can come out. Now they're easily identifiable. We can now easily create ministries designed to reach them, those who want to move. This is what God is inviting us to do. Shift our assignment from this self-centered focus to this other-centered focus. God is wanting to shift our attention from self to him. He's got it. He's in control. He's running this thing. Now he is calling us to be witnesses of the change that he can bring to others. And finally, God wants to shift our assurance from what we see to what he knows. The Bible says, verse 10, they're looking intently up into the sky and Jesus disappears. All they see is Jesus leaving. And in an instant, all of their hopes of their kingdom and their paradigm is going up literally in smoke in the clouds. And perhaps they are now discouraged. Perhaps there is the temptation for their assurance to wane away. Their confidence in God is threatened now. But instantly God moves in. He's a gracious God. Instantly. The Bible says that suddenly there were two men in white apparel. God will come just at the right time when it seems like all hope is lost. When it seems like he is leaving and has departed and has left us alone, he sends two men in white to simply declare to us, I'm coming back. Be sure of it. As bad as things might get in this world, as difficult as times may seem, as much as it may seem like God has just left this place, Shift your assurance from what you can see to what God already knows and has declared. He is coming back. This is the new paradigm. Jesus is coming soon. This ought to thrill your soul with amazing excitement. You ought to be confident. You ought to be thrilled. You ought to be happy that Jesus is coming again. Not so, not so that he can take me away and burn up all of those homosexuals. No, but because he is guaranteed to finish his work. And his work is to redeem everybody that wants to be saved. It is his paradigm to reach everybody. Yeah, the Samaritans too. Yeah, those who are on the outermost parts of life, who are in the outermost parts of the moral spectrum. God wants to reach them too. And he's called us to be his witnesses. As the paradigm is shifting, God saying stabilize yourself by shifting your attention. Trust God that he's in control. Shift your assignment. Understand clearly that the centerpiece of God's paradigm shift is that we be witnesses to those who are lost. Testifying of the transforming power of God and finally God wants us to shift our assurance from what we can see, from what we simply see, 
to what he has promised, to what he knows. And that is he will finish the work he's begun. That's our commitment today. 